What's up, everybody? It's Professor Keegan. Um, apologies to those of you who showed up to class today physically and found that our classroom was unavailable. Um, I'm hoping that's something that doesn't happen again. I'm going to look into why it took place. Um, so we collectively decided that I would send a video lecture to all of you covering today's material just to get you ready for your journal entry this coming weekend. Um, I won't take too much time um, in this video lecture because long videos are not the best teaching modality. I do believe that actually talking as a group together is better, but this is better than nothing. Um, so quickly, we are wrapping up our Thinking Queerly unit. Um, this is a unit where we're practicing some of the strategies, criticalities, um, and interventions of queer studies by looking at what I'm sure last week felt like fairly familiar issues with marriage equality. This week we've moved into broader um, structural analyses and today we're hearing from a group of people we might not, not normally hear from, which is transgender specific critiques of a progress narrative. That progress narrative um, is the narrative that visibility and representation have wildly increased for trans people in the media, in entertainment, uh, in the awareness of transgender identities, and that that automatically results in better outcomes for trans people. That's a, a narrative we're gonna question today, and it's a narrative that these authors are highly skeptical of for reasons that they explain. So I'll quickly unpack some of the material for you. You should feel free to ask questions via email or raise questions when we get back together next week, or you know, explore some questions in your journal. Um, so again, apologies for a video, but this is a nice way to remind you that I do have a very attractive face. Uh, let's get started. Oh, to get started, actually, this image I wanted to share with you is actually the really iconic image of Laverne Cox, who's now, by now, a very famous trans actress and activist. Um, in 2014, her image was put on the cover of Time Magazine. It is the first time this had happened with Time Magazine. Um, and the story accompanying the image was called The Transgender Tipping Point. And this is a, an article that these pieces critique. In this piece, the author claimed that transgender equality was kind of an unavoidable um, sort of outcome of where we were heading, um, given the increase in representation that we were seeing. Almost a decade later, I think we can safely say that that assumption was incorrect. Trans, pe trans people are not enjoying social equality. And in many ways, trans people's social status has actually deteriorated over the past maybe six or seven years. So right out of the gate, we should be aware that equating cultural or media representation with progress and get rights gains is not necessarily a good assumption to make, right? Okay, so I was going to ask you about a number of quotes the material um, uses like that I wanted to center you on. So I'm just going to talk you through these. Hopefully some of these um, are in your notes as things you noticed and, and either underlined or highlighted or starred or wrote down, but they are key moments in the materials um, that I think are important to this critique of pro uh, the idea that visibility equals progress. Um, and again, we're reading pieces by two different groups of people. One is an introduction to an area of a journal issue um, edited by Aaron Izura called Unrecognizable on Trans Recognition in 2017. And the other is the introduction to a book called Trap Door, um, which is about transgender visibility and cultural production. Um, these are all written by trans people, these pieces. So I'm kind of mushing them together in this lecture because the points they're making are so interconnected. But I'm really centering you on a number of places in these texts where the authors are pointing out um, the dangers of visibility and some of the drawbacks of visibility, particularly for trans people, okay? So um, here's a quote. At the same time, we know that when produced within the cosmology of racial capitalism, the promise of positive representation ultimately gives little support or protection to many, if not most, trans and gender nonconforming people, particularly those who are low income and or of color. The very people whose lives and labor constitute the ground for the figuration of this moment of visibility. 
this is the trap of the visual or more accurate uh it offers or more accurately it is frequently offered to us as the primary path through which trans people might have access to livable lives um this is an area where this piece is pointing out that positive representation um doesn't really produce material effects that improve trans people's lives just because we're getting positive characters or celebrities that model sort of positive affirmative styles of transgender identification in the media doesn't mean that trans people are getting material or political support right we need to think critically about how one does not equate with the other and one might actually be a driver like this increased visibility might actually be a driver of increased violence against the most vulnerable trans people um, where they indicate low enough color trans people, low income and of color trans people who are not able to necessarily uh, present themselves as the same sort of respectable um, image that we see in the media of trans people, right? So they say it's the trap of the visual because once you're visible, you can be targeted. Um, it's not always to be celebrated. Sometimes it's to be attacked. And that works both ways in the trans community because the trans community is very diverse. There are people with a lot of um, privilege and control over their lives. And there are a lot of people with almost none, right? So we have to think critically about what vis visibility does to a range of folks, okay? Um, another quote I pulled out that I wanted you to think about is this one. As the writers in this section make clear, recognition may have arrived, but justice for trans people has not yet begun. Um, recognition is rather abstract and it depends on somebody recognizing you. It's still dependent on a power structure in which people with privilege allow you to be recognized by them, right? So it's not necessarily as liberating as it sounds, right? Um, still dependent on cis people, non-trans people, um, treating and saying, treating trans people as human and saying, yes, I recognize you as human. Um, justice is a little different. Justice is actually the process of moving resources and power to an underprivileged community and redressing harm. Um, so this point notes that recognition doesn't displace necessarily dominant power structures while justice would and look around we do not necessarily have justice for trans people right now we have a we have a lot of cultural recognition of yes we see you uh and we have a lot of persecution at the same time right the opposite of justice so thinking about how those two don't necessarily follow one another is important this is from the Isura. It says, the title of this section, Unrecognizable, is intended to highlight a conviction shared by these essays that even if recognition is inevitable, we may not always want to be identified, right? So here, what the author is saying is, it seems like people are going to keep being aware of trans people. Like the, the moment in which we were relatively historically or culturally invisible is over. Um, However, that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to be highly visible in this way. And maybe it would be better if we weren't in some instances. Um, or maybe the way in which recognition takes place needs to be changed so that it's not a cisgender majority gazing and looking and consuming images of trans people and then also like not changing anything materially about the culture to make trans people's lives better. Being a somebody means visibility, becoming a population, becoming a demographic, becoming part of a class, becoming clockable. In all these contexts, it means having to arm yourself with your brokenness. Um, I think here the point is the reading, this first reading, known unknowns, um, talks about the difference between being a somebody um, sort of within the state or nobody against it, right? The idea that the state treats some people as if they matter um, and holds out its hand and says, come on in. That's what happened with marriage equality. Um, a lot of people, queer people were kind of all on the outside of the dominant notions of family 
And then the state decided to make some people into somebodies, meaning, hey, come on into marriage, come on into the normal way things are done, be over here with the somebodies, you're not a nobody anymore, right? But what did that do to the remaining nobodies? They now have less solidarity with the people who used to belong to their group, and they're more highly identifiable and different than they were before, right? So, you know, the reading suggests that sometimes it's better to be a nobody um, because that way you're not automatically in alignment with state power all the time. It's it's a space where you can think through other ways to do things, and it could be actually really valuable. When we look at queer social formations over the course of the last 400 years or so, um, that is a collection of nobodies often, people who are kind of outside or under the radar of major institutions who are doing things differently. That's where queer culture lives. It's in the collective of nobodies. Um, and these authors are concerned about what happens when the state reaches out its hand and says, come on over here and be like us, come be normal with us. Doesn't that just preserve the mechanisms of marginalization and direct them elsewhere. That's what happened, right? That's why there's such a huge backlash right now against trans people. Um, a lot of people decided, well, we can't pick on gay and lesbian people anymore because uh, they have rights now, they're somebodies. So where can we direct this energy now? Oh, let's direct it at the nobodies, right? Um, so thinking about somebodiness and nobodiness um, could be useful for thinking through relationships to power. So those are just a few spots in the reading that I think are illustrative of this intervention these authors are making around visibility, that visibility is not always great, does not always lead to good outcomes. And if you think about it, is very much modeled on gay and lesbian narratives of coming out and being out and proud and pride marches and things like that. And that seems to have worked for some gay and lesbian people. But we need to think a little carefully about the fact that LGBTQ culture is intersectional and the way one group goes about their visibility politics does not necessarily apply to everybody in the group, right? Think about it. If you're a gay or lesbian, coming out and being visible is a way of saying, I'm not who you thought I was. I have this internal reality that I need you to constantly be aware of, right? So... I'm gonna be out about being gay because otherwise you would assume I'm not, right? And it's important for me to, for you to know that I am actually gay or lesbian. Trans people, transness itself is a little different. It kind of works inside out. So once trans people transition, it's not always their goal to have people highly aware that they're trans or that they were used to be assigned in a different gender. To be truly who they are, trans people want you to treat them exactly as how they appear, right? They don't necessarily want a backstory um, to come out. They don't want necessarily their transness to be highly visible because then that causes people to start poking holes in their identity, asking questions. Um, and it, so, it's not the same logic of visibility for trans identities. Um, and so it's really dangerous to apply something that works for cisgender, i.e. non-transgender, gay and lesbian people to trans people um, as if it's just a one-to-one -one relationship, right? So again, we see these errors popping up, right? We see monolithic error right there. We cannot treat all LGBTQ people the same way or make assumptions about how visibility will impact their, you know, their risk factors. Um, we can't assume that will happen the same way for everybody because LGBTQ culture is so complex and diverse and contains so many different types of people, right? We have to be attentive to how these identities function differently. And then also, right, we can't assume that simply increasing the number of representations or improving their quality will necessarily lead to better social outcomes. Look around, we have tons of trans representation on the internet, in the news media, in entertainment media, more than ever. And yet there's more animus and antagonism also directed at trans people, more than ever, right? So the two, one does not necessarily solve the other. And I would say actually visibility could actually cause the antagonism or make it easier to, to pick on trans people, figure out where trans people are and go after them, right?
So this is another example of how these errors affect LGBTQ issues and in this sense affect trans issues particularly. So remember, um, I'm sorry, I think my box is over this, but you'll notice these columns again um, that we've been using. There is a conservative or right-wing con position, anti-position against including trans people in things, right? We're aware of this, there's resistance. Um, those assumptions are often based on the natural superiority of non-trans people and non-trans bodies. Um, you know, being trans means you're somehow deficient, right? That's the assumption that, that this group has. And their goal is to maintain erasure and or negative representations of trans people, right? They want to see trans people stigmatized. They want to see trans people marginalized, excluded, mandated out of existence um, as solutions to the problem of transness. So we may be aware of this as transphobia, right? Or trans antagonism. And then there's the liberal moderate pro trans visibility argument, which is inclusive and assimilationist, wants to fold trans people into existing media, existing institutions. Um, this is based on the idea that visibility will improve how trans people are treated in the culture, right? If we just educate people about trans identity or show them good, positive representations, they won't dislike trans people anymore or they won't be scared of trans people anymore. And the assumption here is that adding positive representations of trans people to dominant culture is kind of like the end goal, right? Like we just want more diversity as if that will automatically solve structural inequality, which is a little sus, okay? And then there's the position we're hearing about from today, which we could map politically on a sort of left-wing radical analysis, which again is an anti assimilationist argument. It's a little different than some of the others we've been hearing. So let me drill down into this, right? These authors are highly aware that visibility actually increases some of the things we were talking about last class. Pol gender policing and policing of trans populations, violence against transgender people, and exclusion of transgender people. Because once people are aware of you, if they don't like you, then they know where and who you are, and they have better ways of tracking you down and antagonizing and limiting your rights, right? We've seen how that's happened over the past, I'd say five years in the US, to the extent now that we have a lot of groups trying to ban trans access to medical care, which was already difficult, right? So um, all this visibility actually armed the opponents of trans rights with a lot of knowledge about who trans people are, what trans people are doing and where trans people live and need resources from, right? So visibility is not always good. And if you are of color or poor or disabled, visibility is going to increase systems that already harm you, right? So instead of, and it might be a little hard to figure out what these authors want, right? Because I think hearing from trans specific positions is a little harder to map for us. We're much more familiar with identities that problematize the sex and gender system more lightly. Gay and lesbian identities really only operate on the surface of the sex and gender system as identities that problematize sexuality, right? Sexual, the norms of sexuality, which have to do with, um, you know, I have a, very, a stable sex and gender and I'm simply attracted to other people with that same stable sex and gender. Trans identities, they're, they're situated at a little deeper level in terms of the fact that trans people who medically transition destabilize the sex binary. They destabilize the categories by which we even keep track of gay and lesbian identification. Because once you have people who move between sexed boxes or whose genders aren't easily mapped in a binary, you start entering a world where same sex relationships start to get very unstable, right? It's hard to say what a man or a woman is. It's hard to say what's gay and what's straight. And so these voices are a little harder for us to grab onto because they're coming from a position that is, is not as familiar. It's not as normative, right? It's further down that LGB blah, 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 right? 
Um, so what do these people want? Well, basically what they're saying is like, trans survival should not be dependent on cis people accepting us or being able to stare at us or thinking nicely about us. What we need are networks of care and mutual aid that promote trans survival and trans you know, liberation that don't depend on cis people thinking nice things about us. Because what if they decide they don't like us? Um, that has been the case over the past five years. We've seen what's happened. Um, so thinking about how recognition and visibility often and tolerance or acceptance, they all operate by recentering people with power. They all operate by recentering straight and cis people as the people accepting or recognizing or tolerating the marginalized group and, or, or with visibility being allowed to consume images of that group, right? In the, in the consumer market. So that is to say, think a little critically about the demand for, oh, more diversity, more representation is just gonna produce good things. Well, if you don't have structural change attached, if you don't have your eye on materiality, resources, justice, redistributive mechanisms, then sometimes visibility can backfire. And that's what we've gone through in the past five years. Okay, so wrapping the unit. You can ask yourself some of these things on your own. Um, remember when we talked about metacognition, like former knowledge, and then the, the moment where you kind of develop this raising up out of the, the former knowledge so you can look back on it and see what you were thinking and maybe why you were thinking it and recontextualize what you didn't know based on what you do now, right? That moment. At the end of every week, we're trying to produce that sensation of, ah, right? Um, I'd like to see some thinking about this in your journal uh, because we're going to be rewinding 500 years next week and we're gonna be keeping all the skills and critiques, all of the criticality that we've developed in this unit about how to think queerly. We're gonna start applying it to actual far past histories. Um, and we're gonna leave behind the more familiar like contemporary issues unit. So for your journal, be thinking of it in preparation for that about what did we just do? What did you think we were gonna be doing? And how are you feeling now about the course? Is it turning into something different from what you expected? And where are you positioned in that process of taking on the ability to do queer analysis? Don't forget journals by the end of Sunday. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and I'll stop here.